Hello everyone and welcome back to class five on uh, motion pictures. This is our third and final class on motion pictures. And after this class, I believe you are ready to take the first test. So double check the schedule, but I believe after this class, you are ready for the very first test. And so motion pictures, the uh, topic or the unit big enough that it needed uh, three separate classes. And uh, even then, it's pretty tightly packed, that's for sure. So let's get going. We were talking about the 1970s uh, in our last class, and I wanted to remind everybody that this is the era of not only the, uh, the uh, film school directors, right? We talked about the film school directors, uh, uh, Scorsese and Coppola, Spielberg, people like that but also the era of the anti-hero. There's Travis Bickle from Martin Scorsese's tra Taxi Driver, and there were plenty of other anti-heroes uh, in the 1970s. There have always been anti-heroes in movies. Uh, they're, they're a great hero. They go back to the 30s, probably even earlier than the 1930s, and into the 19, 1940s and so on. But in the 1970s and the late 60s with Bonnie and Clyde uh, and um, movies like that, it's certainly what, and Taxi Driver, certainly an era of the anti-hero. Still in the 1970s, we have Jaws, and um, this is from Steven Spielberg, 1975, right in the middle of the decade, based on a book set in the summer, and it's a wonderful film, but we're going to spend most of the time talking about its effect on business, the business side of things. Uh, so let's talk about the film a little bit. I've linked uh, to a couple of nice scenes of the shark attacks, and then we are going to talk about the business side of things. So, as you can see, this was a uh, mechanical shark. Uh, this is before CGI, right? They wouldn't have been able to do a shark like this before, I would say, the year 2000, maybe even a little later than that. I don't, I'm not even sure. They might have been able to do it uh, in the 90s. Uh, they did some pretty good dinosaurs with Jurassic Park, so maybe they could have done a pretty good dinosaur in the 1990s, uh, but maybe into the 2000s. So they are a ways away, almost uh, 20, 25 years away from being able to do something uh, like a shark with CGI. So they built this mechanical one. They built it in a freshwater tank. Apparently it had trouble in the salt water. Uh, lots and lots of problems. Uh, with the shark uh, causing lots of delays. Poor Steven Spielberg, the legendary Steven Spielberg, was just a kid back then in his 20s, um, really still wet behind the ears and taking a lot of uh, heat from the studio and a lot of heat from the film crew uh, and so on. He, re do he remembers this film as a real miserable experience, but he turned out a brilliant film and it really did set his reputation and really got him going. Um, and so he and the editor, Verna Fields, they just about cut the shark out of the movie. And I've been telling students this for a long time. I went back and I timed it. I, I took out my copy of the DVD and timed it. And the shark is only in the movie about 2 minutes and 22 seconds. And this is a movie about a shark, so 2 minutes and 22 seconds. And they would, you'd see the shark for a half a second, 3 quarters of a second, a quarter of a second, they were counting frames of film. There are 24 frames per second in film, and they were counting frames, 16 frames, 12 frames, something like that. So they just about cut the shark out of the movie, and it worked out pretty well. The audience is going to fill in uh, all the gaps and everything, right? The scariest place uh, is our imaginations, uh, not under the bed or in the closet or in the dark or anything like that. Our imaginations can make things very scary. And just uh, jumping ahead a little bit to another movie that we're not going to uh, deal with uh, extensively uh, in, uh, in this class is Alien. And the Alien in Alien is on screen for less than that, if you know the, the, the movie Alien by Ridley Scott. So um, now today we could probably have the Alien and the Shark, you know, having breakfast together. Uh, CGI is amazing and wonderful these days. But back then we had to rely on imaginations uh, as much as anything else, and Spielberg and Ridley Scott knew how to exploit that. They did a wonderful job. So I've linked to a couple of scenes. Um, in the second scene, the second shark attack, uh, you're going to see 
a couple of real interesting things. I want to talk about that. Uh, Spielberg puts the camera kind of low on the tripod, almost like we are sitting in the sand uh, on the beach, and almost like we are in the water. So he, he puts the audience very low uh, um, uh, by his camera placement. There are lots of bits of yellow throughout that scene. Yellow is kind of an active color. It's an excitable color. It's not quite as obvious as red, but there are uh, yellow hats and blankets and towels and life rafts and all sorts of yellow sprinkled throughout the scene. You'll notice that. Um, you will also notice that we are seeing a lot of this through Chief Brody's eyes, and he is new to the island like we are new to the island uh, as an audience and uh, he's sort of an outsider and uh, while he's sitting there in his beach chair people keep walking in front of his view and we like to be able to see what's going on if something's going to be scary we don't want to have our view blocked and that's partly why we don't like the dark right we can't see what's out there in the dark under the bed or in the closet or in the forest uh, it could be a wolf or a lion who knows what's out there in the dark so we, we don't like to have our view blocked uh, in any way uh, he's also going to do the false alarm. That's a great trope for horror. Uh, we're going to hear screaming and so on, and it's a false alarm. It's just a, a, a couple of teenagers uh, playing in the water. So that's a, that's a great thing. He's really got it timed out just beautifully. The whole scene is just a couple of minutes, uh, and it's really wonderful. And instead of a shark, we're going to get that wonderful John Williams bum 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 bum. Get that wonderful bass line, okay? And we are going to see through the shark's eyes. That's POV, point of view. And so we're going to hear the music, we're going to see through the shark's eyes, and we learn that that is how the shark was represented in the very first attack. And so now by the second attack, when we get the POV and the music, we're really scared and we're really ready for that. We're really scared. Um, and then uh, he's going to introduce us to our two, for, uh, our, actually our second and third victims, uh, Pippet the dog, um, chasing a, a stick out into the water, and little Alex, uh, Kentner the boy, uh, and uh, we're going to meet him just a little bit. And, Mommy, can I go out in the water, right? So he's going to go out. We're going to meet our two victims very briefly, and that makes it uh, even harder. And that's what you have to do with, with horror. You have to introduce the victims even briefly. Uh, before you before you kill them off, okay. So a wonderful scene uh, there, and um, so the studio is very nervous, and they were going to go for a wide release. And now that's not the usual uh, back then. First off, big movies didn't tend to come out in the summer. That's when they would sort of dump movies into drive-ins and things like that, and. Um, they uh, uh, um, decided that they were having problems with the shark and they wanted to hedge their bets. Now, they had some test audiences and they were getting some pretty good uh, results from their test audiences and so on, focus groups. But they still weren't really sure this, this young director and this mechanical shark that didn't work very well and the shark was hardly in the movie at all. So they put it out in a wide release. They advertised it very heavily and... Um, and positive word got out. Now, the cynical reason is we will get as many people to see this possible turkey as we can. And before word gets out that it's a bad movie, we will have had a decent-sized opening weekend, and maybe we'll make some of our money back. So that's kind of cynical, but that's kind of the way Hollywood operates, and that uh, strategy really worked uh, for Jaws, the big opening weekend. They didn't dribble it out. Uh, into theaters, uh, New York and L.A. and a couple of big theaters, and then Chicago and whatever, and Toronto and stuff like that, and, and, and roll it out throughout the summer. That was the normal way that big movies tended to come out before Jaws, bit by bit, a limited release, that's called. And they went against the, the business, uh, the normal business strategy. They opened it fairly wide, for its time, fairly wide, not like today with thousands and thousands of theaters. Um... And uh, they're, I hate to say getting people suckered into seeing the movie on opening weekend, but they really wanted everybody to see it on opening weekend before word got out that it was possibly a bad movie. And it wasn't, and it made lots and lots of money, and that, that strategy, that opening weekend push, 
uh, has taken hold ever since. Ever since 1975, big summer movies, heavy advertising. You can advertise on television because that makes a lot of sense uh, if it's nationwide. If you're, at, if you're spending all your advertising dollars on television and it's only opening in a couple of cities, it doesn't make so much sense. So uh, that really that really set it, right? That set Hollywood ever since 1975. Big summer movies, big opening weekends. 1977, just a couple years later, George Lucas with his third film, okay, it's his third film, um, and uh, he, he, he made his uh, college uh, senior project into a feature film, THX 1138, and then he made American Graffiti, which is a big hit. American Graffiti made a lot of money, so um, I knew who George Lucas was. I was ready to see his next movie. I liked American Graffiti. Um, but it surprised really everybody with Star Wars. I have linked to the original uh, trailer, and it's kind of weird because uh, when he made the very first film, uh, uh, Luke and Leia and Darth Vader, uh, their relationships weren't solidified as they were in the second and third movies. They weren't brother and sister, so they're kind of emphasizing that this movie is a, a, a romance. Uh, they're going to say the story of a boy and a girl and a and a universe and things like that, and they're going to cut to the scene where she kisses him on the cheek and so on. Um, and it really looks like it's a romance between Luke and Leia, which is kind of icky uh, today, as we know they are brother and sister, and uh, George and others have noted that it wasn't really fixed, uh, that they were even going to be able to make a sequel to Star Wars. Um, but uh, when George made the sequel, um, they changed, they changed track. So, um, George Lucas, he um, didn't really like the studio input. He was a lot like Steven Spielberg, very young, just a couple years out of film school, um, taking lots of notes from the studio. Um, most directors hate notes, you know. Why does he have to have that, uh, that outfit on? And why is her hair like that? And why is his name this? And they just keep asking questions and pestering, and it's like, flies buzzing around the director, they're trying to direct their movie, and they keep getting notes from the studio, and why does Darth Vader have to breathe like that, and they, you know, they just ask all these inane questions after they have approved the script and the budget and all that kind of stuff, and he hated that, most directors do, so he sold the rights uh, to Star Wars to the studio, and they paid him a lot of money, and then he could go off and finance the rest of the movies on his own, he didn't have to go to the studio anymore. He kept the rights to the toys, though. He kept those rights, and he made more money off the toys than the studio made off of the film. And they wanted to be in the George Lucas uh, business, so they uh, distributed all the rest of the movies. But he could make the movies on his own. He didn't have to listen to the studio uh, and their notes and things like that. Um, and uh, so that is really every director's dream <laughs> to have, you know, final cut, and they don't have to listen to the studio and all the whole rest of it. But that's important right there. The action figures, okay, that's important, and we are getting into the whole business side of things, as you'll, as you notice, okay. Um, the most I remember from Jaws were T-shirts. I remember T-shirts, but I don't remember much more from Jaws and the soundtrack album. Both of these soundtrack albums, and you don't think of Star Wars as having any hit songs on it, but it was such a big movie that even the soundtrack album with John Williams' score sold uh, was at the top of the charts. Um, the other uh, interesting thing about the toys was it surprised everybody. Toys take a long time to get to market. Um, and so the movie came out in May, and they couldn't get enough toys out for Christmas. They couldn't get enough toys out for Christmas. You, you got to make them. You got to package them. You got to get them on the ships from China and, and get them to America by October or November so they can get into stores and all that. It's a really long-term process. And... Um, there were, uh, uh, like, uh, um, uh, just slips of paper and things like that, uh, rain checks, sorry, your toy isn't available from, um, you know, from the toy manufacturer, um, and, uh, you know, so kids weren't getting their Star Wars Christmas toys until, I don't know, February or March or something like that of the next year, and nobody wants to be in that situation, nobody wants to be in that situation, um, and, uh, on, as a side point, uh, when a new movie comes out, whether it's a Harry Potter movie or a Star Wars movie or, or any kind of movie, um, 
a lot of stuff sneaks out through the toys, right? Hey, there's a new toy. There's a new Harry Potter toy. There's a new whatever uh, um, creature. There's this BB-8 toy, and, and word leaks out of the design of the toys months before the movie is released. So uh, anyway, um, if, you wanna, if you wanna really know way early what's going on, get a friend who uh, works at uh, Mattel or something like that. Or Kenner, I think Kenner, I think uh, Star Wars had Kenner. So, business side of all this, what do Jaws and Star Wars bring to us? Well, they start showing the studios of revenue streams, right? Revenue, that's the money coming in, and for the most part, the revenue was the money people paid to go see the movie in the theater. That was it. That, that was it for, for uh, uh, Casablanca, and that was it for uh, about 2001, and The Graduate, and, uh, and uh, Gone with the Wind, right? How much money does the movie make at the box office? And now they start uh, getting more and more money from outside the U.S. Uh, today it's 70%, but more from outside the U.S. Then home videos, which would be just on TV, really, and then VHS, and then DVD, and then streaming, and cable, and soundtrack albums, even if it's not a musical. Musical albums, you know, uh, uh, The Sound of Music and Mary Poppins, they, all, they always did well, soundtrack albums, but even movies without really hits were doing well. And video games later on, not in the 70s, video games started doing well. Toys, Lucas, he figured that out. Books, clothes, um, all that, all that kind of stuff, little, uh, 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 little Winnie the Pooh jammies, right? All that stuff, that's all revenue, all streams of revenue. You think of just streams pouring into the river, right? Streams of money pouring into the river. And uh, so business starts changing in Hollywood, figuring out that there's more ways to make money. Uh, the studios start getting consolidated, getting bought up by bigger and bigger companies and things like that. Uh, Disney, uh, not in the 70s, but later on, they start doing that too, and obviously buying up lots of uh, property like uh, like Pixar and Marvel and uh, Muppets and all that, right? So that is uh, consolidation, either getting bought or buying uh, more properties. And uh, that's the Disney headquarters up in Burbank, by the way. Isn't that nice? Of course. And uh, this is also uh, the new... Uh, Galaxy's Edge and Star Wars Land. And synergy is the term that starts getting bandied about in the business world. Disney is very good at it. They're all good at it. Um, but, uh, you know, linking together your film division, your TV division, your theme parks, right? You can go to, uh, you can go to uh, Disneyland Theme Park and you can um, see uh, uh, characters from the movies and things like that. Oh, okay, I'm glad that went away. Uh, you can go on cruise lines. They have a radio station, uh, radio channel, radio network, streaming service, cable. All of that is all working together, right, hand in hand. Not um, one division, not the TV division competing with the movie division, like you might get in a lot of companies, right, where they would pit uh, the, the heads of the divisions against each other to see who gets promoted to CEO. Here, you know, in Disney and, and others, um, and even um, uh, even uh, Universal, right? If you go to uh, if you go to uh, Universal, you're going to see Fast and Furious and things like that too. So uh, most of the rides at uh, the theme parks, even the original rides, right? See Sleeping Beauty's Castle and Peter Pan and all that kind of stuff uh, were based on Disney property way back in the 50s. They're still doing that with uh, with all the Star Wars stuff. Rebooting is starting all over again, almost like the other ones didn't exist. Uh, you have already gone through some reboots. You've gone through a Spider-Man reboot. If you're if you're only 19 or 20, you've, you've even been through a couple of Spider-Man reboots, a couple of Batman reboots. Um, you might have uh, gone through a James Bond reboot. And um, so... You know, got to keep it going, right? There's a new generation every 10 or 15 years, 20 years. Kids that grow up on that stuff, and now they're old and adults, and they have kids, and um, they haven't had to reboot uh, 
the uh, Star Wars stuff. They're just sort of extending it and extending it. Um, but it's kind of weird, right? When all of a sudden, if you grew up on the very first um, Iron Man or the very first James Bond, and all of a sudden it's not Sean Connery anymore. And I think I talked about this before, when, how shocked you would be when, when there's a new... When there's a new Iron Man or a new Thor or a new Harry Potter, but it'll happen. Okay, um, intellectual property—that's the—that's the term IP, and you hear that sort of a business term being bandied about. Um, and um, Universal has IP of uh, Dracula and Frankenstein's monster and the Invisible Man and all that, and they just can't seem to do anything with it. Uh, they were trying to get their Dark Universe, whatever it is, uh, going. Um, and um, they really couldn't. Um, they don't own the rights to Frankenstein's Monster or Dracula because they're in the public domain, but they have you know, certain claims on the makeup and, and design and story and some of that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, anything that's in your catalog, anything that's back there that you own, right? Um, who would have thought, really, who would have thought Transformers? It's a kid's toy. It doesn't really even have that much of a story. I guess it was a cartoon, but who would have thought that Transformers would be valuable intellectual property. So um, almost anything, almost anything can be valuable intellectual property if it's, if it's treated right. So today, 70% of Hollywood film revenue comes from overseas. I love that and I love this poster here. Um, I keep asking my students if anybody can read this. It looks to me, it could be Chinese, uh, but China, there is no Chinese language. It would be Mandarin or Cantonese or something like that. Um, I don't think it's Korean. Um, so anyway, I don't know. But uh, I've never had a student that could read this yet. Maybe you can read it and tell me what it says. I'm sure it says Star Wars or something. But Anyway, I love that poster. And only 30% from domestic box office, if we do a little, a little math there. So that's really something. That's why a lot of movies... Um, are geared really for an international audience. And you will start seeing, because there is such a large audience in China, that um, unlike the James Bond movies of the 1960s, uh, they're not making Chinese villains much anymore. Right? They want these movies to play in China, or even Russian villains uh, much anymore, with James Bond movies and things like that, and Fast and Furious and, and whatnot. Uh, North Korea is fair game. Um, you know, bad... Uh, businessmen and uh, uh, drug lords, okay, but picking on a nationality uh, like Russia or China is kind of out, right, because they want to sell these movies around the world so that they can pick on um, types, like I say, like business people, spies, things like that. Action movies are the easiest to market to foreign audiences, okay, and uh, we've had plenty of examples of that. Here's another Another um, poster there. I, I, I'm guessing that says Avengers or something, but um, they are the easiest. What have you got with action? Chasing and fighting, right? Chasing and fighting. So sure, everybody can understand that. That's not hard to figure out. Studios fought TV, and they fought home video, and they fought streaming. We've talked about this a little bit already. Uh, they really have a hard time seeing the future. They're paid a lot of money, but oftentimes they miss things that seem, to a lot of people, kind of obvious. Um, and yeah, streaming, it's hard. You know, how can we monetize this, they're thinking. How can we monetize this? We're giving it away. We're giving it away. So we're going to talk about this more when we talk about the recording industry as well. All right, switching topics away from all that business, and we're going to talk about independent cinema. And that really took hold in the late 80s and early 90s. And what we have are non-studio films that are made. Often uh, they would go to a film festival. Okay, here's the Sundance Film Festival. And uh, the filmmaker, filmmakers have maxed out their credit cards and they've go funded me and all of that and scraped by and got some money together and made a pretty good film and it's won some awards, but now what? Now what? So um, I liken uh, film festivals uh, to like uh, talent scouts. Um, oftentimes, if there is a really hot high school football player or basketball player, scouts will go to the game. Certainly college 
football scouts show up to see that new uh, basketball player, football player, baseball phenom with a 90 mile an hour fastball. And that's what it's like with the movies. They show up and they're basically they're looking at college uh, kids, um, new movies. They're not in college anymore, but that's kind of, that's kind of what it is. They're looking for new talent, right? Is there somebody that we can sign? Is there a really good movie here? Like uh, Little Miss Sunshine or Blair Witch Project or something like that. Um, uh, uh, Napoleon Dynamite, right? Some little film. And so they are looking for uh, the great new bit of talent. And uh, probably... Uh, nine times out of 10, or even 99 times out of 100, they're gonna spend money on a movie that's gonna tank at the box office. Studios are gonna lose a lot of money buying movies that just don't take off. They seem like they're good movies and they won awards, but they just don't take off and they're gonna lose money. So when they get that one film, when they get that Blair Witch Project or something like that, uh, they are gonna take the lion's share of the profits. The filmmakers, the director, the producers, they're, not, they're gonna maybe get their money back. Okay, they're going to, how much did you spend on this film? We spent $5 million on the film. Okay, we'll give you five and a half, maybe six. Okay, and now the movie makes $75 million. The money's going to go mostly to the studio, right? $75 or $100 or $200 million, like Blair Witch. The director isn't going to get that money. No, they're not going to get that money. The studio's trying to recoup their losses. But what does the director get or the writer or the star? They hopefully are going to get a career. That's what they are... Uh, hoping for. They're hoping for a career and then they can make the sequel to the Blair Witch Project or something like that or the sequel to whatever or just another movie that they want to do and um, and they will get a career but they don't really make much off of that uh, that hit, that surprise hit, that surprise independent film festival hit. So we're going to talk about Quentin Tarantino. Uh, he went through the film festival circuit, his uh, first films and picked up and they made lots of money. Don't worry about all the films. We're going to we're going to focus in on pulp fiction. Okay, don't don't worry. I'm not going to ask you the list of these films or anything like that. But that that's the Quentin Tarantino films. Um uh and uh John Travolta and Uma Thurman there. Um but pulp fiction, I've linked to a couple of scenes from Pulp Fiction. It's a uh, wonderful film. It really was very influential on scripts uh coming out. Uh the scene that we have of them uh, John Travolta is uh, coming back from some work in Europe. He has spent some time, I'm not sure if he's on the lam or what, coming back from spending time in Amsterdam and in Paris. And he's talking to his fellow hitman, um, Samuel L. Jackson. And he's talking about things that are a little bit different over there. They don't have quarter pounders because they are on the metric system. It's a wonderful conversation. Um, and Royale with cheese and all that wonderful conversation about how things are a little bit different and a little bit the same, um, and it sort of pulls the movie forward, right? If you're if you if you're too clever for your own good and you write this funny little scene about who do you like better, Superman or Batman or Marvel or DC or Captain Crunch or something, you know, it, it's a cute bit, but it sort of stops the movie dead in its tracks, and you can't really do that. Um, and uh, Tarantino manages to write scenes that sort of are going to thread their way through the film, and they're going to come back, and that's what he did with Pulp Fiction. And there were lots of Quentin Tarantino wannabes making movies in the 90s and the 2000s with funny, quirky little pop culture conversations um, that really didn't go anywhere. It's, it's, it's harder to do than it looks. Uh, so uh, in that scene in the apartment, uh, he's going to make some references. And so uh, one of the kids who's lying down on the sofa, you might you might notice, you, flock of seagulls, he's going to say, Jack Samuel Jackson, you, flock of seagulls. Well, what does that mean? Well, flock of seagulls, they were a 1980s hair band. So maybe you didn't get the reference. Now you do. Uh, he's also going to talk about in Amsterdam. Now remember, this is the early 90s. Uh, before much widespread legalization in the U.S. and talking about in Amsterdam, you can get uh, you can get marijuana uh, at a coffee shop. And so when I was there a couple of summers ago with my wife and some friends, and we took some pictures. There we go. There's the Easy Times coffee shop. Here's another uh, coffee shop, Smoky. I don't know why they picked coffee shops, but they did. They still have uh, Starbucks uh, in Amsterdam, but they don't sell 
they don't sell weed at uh, Starbucks. But uh, anyway, so there's some, uh, mostly the tourists, right? These are the popular tourist areas in Amsterdam. I'm sure the locals have their own, their own places. They also talk about uh, the quarter pounder, uh, and they don't call it a quarter pounder. Uh, and uh, and you can get you can actually get beer at a McDonald's. So uh, in Paris, went to uh, McDonald's. There's a Heineken on there, and some other stuff, espresso and 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 whatnot. Uh, there we go. There's the Heineken uh, at a McDonald's in Paris. Kind of weird, but kind of nice. And there is the Royale. Royale with cheese, because they don't have quarter pounders, they have the metric system. And what did they put on their french fries in Amsterdam? Oh my god, it's mayonnaise, right? So um, they mention all that, and while we were there, uh, friends' daughters had to order a side of mayo for their french fries. Anyway, doing my due diligence, even while I'm traveling, I'm think of my, thinking of my classes and my students. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, Tarantino's most recent film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, from 2019. It's set in 1969. It's a wonderful film, if you haven't seen it. Um, and um, it's a, kind of the kind of movie that they're not making so much anymore. Um, no superpowers. Not, some a bit of violence, not that much, but mostly it's kind of a two-character sort of a drama thing. And they used to make these movies a lot in the 1970s with all the President's Men and Network and, and uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's and Ass. They used to really crank these kinds of movies out. And now they're kind of rare. Um, and so Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's really kind of kind of a dying breed. Uh, a big budget. They still make lots of dramas, but not with big stars and big budgets. Uh, this movie, it cost maybe 80 or 90 million. Right? They did a lot of location work and built sets and all that, and they got two of the biggest stars in Hollywood, um, but they don't have car chases and superpowers or anything like that. It's a very rare movie. Um, and um, uh, on the periphery of this film uh, is uh, the Manson murders, which happened in Southern California in August of 1969, and we sort of all know people that know about that, they know Cielo Drive, that really means something. Spawn Ranch really means something. Those of us, we, if we hear something like that, we know exactly what that means, because um, uh, we're old. <laughs> um, but if you uh, were interested in that and you want to catch up on that a little bit, there's a pretty good podcast called You Must Remember This, um, and it's on Apple and all sorts of places, and it's about the early years of Hollywood. And she did a multi-part series on Charles Manson's Hollywood, six or seven episodes. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can check out that podcast, Karina Longworth. She does a fantastic job. And if you just like movies in general, uh, it's fantastic. There's lots of cool stuff um, on, uh, on lots of old Hollywood, going back to the silent days and up through maybe the 60s or so, maybe into the 70s, and that's about it. Uh, but a lot of fun. I love that podcast. So... Uh, finishing off with uh, the, the, the future of the business, U.S. studio profits, we've already talked about this, 30% domestic, 70% foreign, for the most part, not every single movie, not every single movie, certainly action movies. Comedies would be a little bit different. Comedies are going to make a little bit more money uh, in the U.S. Okay, so jokes and stuff are a little hard to translate, so comedies don't tend to do that, but the, most of their profits are going to be like that and action. We talked about that, too. 90% uh, of U.S. films are projected and shot digitally. Okay, there's the digital projector. Um, just like the cameras on our phones, right? It's digital and high def and all that. And um, it's, uh, it's up there pretty high. Uh, so high that uh, Kodak Film was uh, almost going under and the studios sort of had to bail them out because... Um, Kodak Film wasn't selling much film. So this really tells a lot. I love this. I, I don't know what the heck tape is. I, I mean, I know what tape is, but I don't know why they put it on here. But anyway, digital is blue, and there we see the digital. And somewhere around 8, 9, it starts sharply going up, right? Sharply going up for digital. It meets with film around 2012. Okay, 
film, 90 plus percent, okay, and then it starts going down right around 2009, 2010, uh, film starts going down, digital starts going up, they meet paths and cross right here in the middle of 2012, and now we're 90 plus percent digital, and um, this a couple years ago, and less for film. So, yeah, really nice graph. Uh, the theatrical window is how long it takes from a movie theater to basically everything else. Basically everything else. And uh, that is getting kind of scary for theater owners because it's shrinking. Okay, it is shrinking. And Netflix is going with less than 30 days of a theatrical window. The Irishman and other movies, right? Major feature films, nominations for Best Picture, all that kind of stuff. And they are not giving them access, uh, um, exclusive access to movie theaters for three months. That's that, that was normal. Three months. If you wanted to see any movie, a Star Wars movie, a Marvel movie, if you wanted to see any movie, you'd have to wait at least three months. You could be patient. Um, but if it's a big, hot movie that everybody needs to see, right? Avengers Endgame or or Star Wars uh, in Chapter 9, then everybody wants to see it. They don't want to wait those 90 days. But people will wait if it's going to be short, if you wait just a month or something, right? So, so this is very uh, irritating to theater owners, that's for sure. They're battling with studios and contracts and all that. The business model is changing. Day and date is same day. Same day, same day, everywhere. And um, that's a problem theatrical window shrinking down to day and date. Big, big problem. More and more uh, conglomerates. This is basically down to five. If we can grab all this and drag and drop it over here to Disney. Okay, if this were a regular thing, I could grab this and drag and drop it over here to Disney that just bought, they didn't buy Fox News or Fox Sports, but they bought the, the Fox movie stuff. So we're really done to five media conglomerates. And Disney, it's a little hard to see. There's Pixar, there's Marvel. That's Lucasfilm right there. Muppets right there. And Disney is still doing quite well. They're the ones that do Frozen uh, and so on. Okay, and then they got their television divisions, right? ABC, ESPN, uh, quite, uh, they're doing quite well. But uh, Warner still has all the Warner Brothers movies and HBO. CNN, so they're, they're doing okay, too. Those are probably the two, two, good, two best, and Comcast would probably be third. So, talking about superheroes, and I'm going to say, I don't know that I have a consensus or anything like that, but I'm going to say the first big-budget superhero movie in my lifetime, not yours, would be Superman in 1978. There's Christopher Reeve, big budget, wonderful sets, all the whole rest of it. And uh, DC had a long lead, right? They had Superman that did extraordinarily well, and they had Batman. Uh, movies directed by Tim Burton, those movies did really, really well in the 70s and 80s. DC was, was above everybody. Um, and then in the 2000s, slowly by 2005, 6, 7, um, Marvel starts taking off. Right? But DC had been around for a while, but, you know, leadership, property, and speaking of intellectual property, um, most of these are minor characters, right? The major characters are, are Spider-Man and the Hulk, right? Spider-Man and the Hulk are to Marvel as Superman and Batman are to DC. They're far and away the biggest. So they're taking these little minor characters, right? Star-Lord and stuff. These are really small characters. And they're turning them in Iron Man. You know, they're turning them into the big stars. But um, they really, if you ask somebody 15 years ago, you know, to name a superhero, it would be Superman. Superman and then Spider-Man and Batman. That would, that would be about it. People weren't naming lots of superheroes back then. There's also the new R-rated uh, comic book or graphic novel. So that's interesting um, with... Uh, uh, Deadpool and uh, and uh, Joker uh, for sure and uh, there are quite a few others um, uh, that are out there uh, 
me think here. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, what's uh, Hugh Jackman? Uh, Logan, right? That was R-rated. Um, and uh, Harley Quinn was R-rated. Um, Watchmen was R-rated. So, you know, there are a number of these R-rated, right? Even though they're supposedly for kids and so on. Comic books, just for kids. But uh, it's sort of the new thing, the R-rated. All right, uh, now we're going to talk about a quick overview of the evolution of computer-generated imagery, CGI. Okay, this is pre-CGI, and that's King Kong, and that is stop motion. And they, uh, this is the, what they call the armature of, of that, and I have linked to a wonderful uh, documentary. It's a full-length documentary, but if you watch from about um, an hour and three minutes to an hour and nine minutes, you get the, the best part of that, and I will, I will mention that in the link. Uh, but if you're into, you know, King Kong and special effects and all that, you can watch the whole thing. But there's a, a six or seven minute part that details stop motion that's quite worth watching. And uh, stop motion was the effect uh, up into the 90s. They were going to do Jurassic Park with stop motion dinosaurs. Um, it had worked, uh, you know, quite well with Ray Harryhausen and his um, Clash of the Titans and um, and uh, all those uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the pirate. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here, but the Sinbad, the Golden Voyage of Sinbad, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, all that stuff, Greek mythology uh, stuff. Okay, with all the the Greek monsters and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that was Ray Harryhausen, and uh, and wonderful stuff. So that worked. That was if you're going to see a movie of special effects, um, maybe some flying stuff with wires. Disney did some of that with Mary Poppins and with uh, the absent minded professor. Uh, or you're going to see stop motion. So it lasted from the 20s to the to the 90s, and Spielberg was going to use it probably for for Jurassic Park until CGI came along. So it's still with us today, but mostly for kids movies. Don't worry about this whole long list, but there are quite a few of them. You might have thought this was a Pixar movie. Uh, Isle of Dogs and Lawson Gromit and Nightmare Before Christmas and so on. Uh, but pretty good directors are working in stop motion. Wes Anderson, Tim Burton, people like that. Some, uh, some good stuff. And that's how big, right? That's only how big they are. And they move them a little bit and then they clip a, click a, 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 a frame or two of film off. Even if it's digital, they're doing about what a frame would be. So that's stop motion, and that's King Kong. In 1968, we have 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's the full title. Best sci-fi film of all time, according to most of the lists, including the American Film Institute. And I mention that because it is pre-CGI. You don't really need CGI to make a good movie. You need a good imagination and a good script and all of that. And the effects look fantastic, but they are not CGI. So uh, before you think that um, it has to be a... Uh, you know, there are no good CGI movies more than 10 years old, or no good sci-fi movies, let's say, no good sci-fi movies more than 10 years old. Uh, then I have to say, uh, you know, Star Wars was pre-CGI, and uh, Blade Runner was pre-CGI, 2001 was pre-CGI, and they're all really top movies. So, um, you know, let's uh, open up our eyes. Uh, plenty of good stuff came out uh, before then. But moving into CGI... Uh, we have the first one, that's The Hand from 1972, and uh, it just rotates, right? And I've linked to that, I think I've linked to that, The Hand, um, and it's kind of fun. And uh, um, so that's really one of the first. Uh, then we have, ten years later, Tron and a digital environment. Now they did it with a black background, and then they dropped in computer-generated backgrounds, right? The actors were wearing costumes and were, were, were sort of glowing. It's, it's not CGI, but they're sort of glowing and stuff. Uh, but otherwise, Tron, right? Tron really starts off the CGI era in a big way, a feature film. That's the year that E.T. came out, and that's the year that Blade Runner came out, and that's the year that um, uh, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan came out, and um, so some pretty good movies came out, and then we have the first of the digital stuff came out, right, the same year as, uh, as E.T. and uh, 
and Blade Runner is Tron. So it's a very transitional year. The 80s are kind of experimental. This movie, by the way, it's set in a computer, so stuff, it looks kind of fake, but that's okay, because we're like in cyberspace, right? So it, 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 they sort of have designed that it might not look real. And so it does. Uh, a wonderful music video, Money for Nothing by Dire Straits, and uh, certainly not realistic, but uh, we start seeing new things like this and uh, bullet time that they did in the matrix you see that stuff in music videos and commercials and stuff first before it makes it into feature films you you see a lot of this stuff um, sort of trial and error so that's fun you check that out i think i've linked to it uh and we get um james cameron with the abyss this is from the abyss and then of course terminator 2 with the t1000 uh, liquid metal, sort of looks like uh, mercury. And then we get our first morphing. So you can you can check that out too. Yeah, I have linked to that. And we have Jurassic Park, 1993. Steven Spielberg, this is a real game changer because now we're on Earth, we're not in we're not in cyberspace and we don't have weird um, weird alien things and stuff like that. It's a it's a it's a real animal. It could be an elephant, really. It's just a big elephant. Or crocodile or something, right? Bird, whatever it is. But it's right there on Earth. And uh, it's a wonderful scene, and I have linked to it. And uh, one of the things you will see, I like to walk through some of Spielberg's uh, wonderful thought process and, and how he puts the scene together. Uh, the Jeep will drive up, and Sam Neill's character will clearly see the dinosaurs and he will uh, take his hat off and then he will take his sunglasses off and he will stand up in the Jeep and his, you know, his eyes are bugging out and his mouth is open and all that and they still don't cut to the dinosaur. And then we uh, cut to him and the camera pans over to Laura Dern. She's looking at a leaf and Sam Neill takes her head and gently turns it to see the dinosaur and then her jaw drops open. She takes her sunglasses off and then finally we cut to the dinosaur. It's very nice. It's a nice little bit of delayed gratification. It's very nice. Okay, it doesn't take very long, but he's sort of building that last bit of tension that we've heard. We've heard about this amazing new movie that's out in theaters, and uh, he really, uh, really builds it quite nicely. But in that scene, the most important, really shot in any scene, is a human face. There's Sam Neill and Laura Dern. Uh, and... Um, and, uh, and it's wonderful, and right, that's, that's where all the emotion and all that. And so until they can do a good human face, then they're not quite there. Now, I would say that they're pretty darn close if they're not already there. Uh, the term is uh, crossing the uncanny valley, and we will talk about that in just a little bit. But not in 1993. And in 1995, we get Toy Story, and we, there's a face, but... That is not a human face. That is a weird, uh, mommy, mommy, I'm scared face. Okay, <laughs> Sid, right? Sid from next door, an awful face. And the people at Pixar were smart enough to know that they weren't doing humans very well, so they just about cut the humans out of the movie. We see feet and hands, uh, and Andy, who does not look very good at all. You probably don't remember how scary Andy is. Uh, but there he is, right? He doesn't look very good. I don't know, he's got mumps or something, but uh, kind of scary. Uh, and in Toy Story 3, apparently Andy, I don't know, reached puberty and started changing, and now he looks pretty good. But uh, um, yeah, in Toy Story 1. And sort of going back and rewriting history, this kind of cracks me up, but rewriting history, um, there is Andy in Toy Story 1, and when we flash back, to young Andy in Toy Story 3, that's what he looks like. Okay, they've, they've rewritten history. Little Andy is no, little freak Andy is no more. Okay, anyway, um, humans were tough. That's the point, I guess. Humans were pretty darn tough for the longest time. Bugs, sure. Fish, monsters, sure. All that, right? Bugs life, all that stuff. Ants, um, all that stuff was fine. Uh, even, even plastic toys. Like Toy Story, they were they were fine. Woody and and uh, Buzz, all that, they looked just fine. But just the humans, the humans were problematic. Star Wars: The Phantom Menace, 
and we have uh, an actor wearing some stuff. It, it's kind of hard because, you know, you want to look actors in the eyes, right? But his eyes are way up there. Um, so uh, for The Phantom Menace and Jar Jar Binks and for Lord of the Rings and Gollum, uh, they had actors on the set. They had actors on the set, and that's a lot easier for other actors to act. Otherwise, you're kind of, you know, they're telling you, look three feet up above your head, and maybe they have a extension pole with a tennis ball on the end of it, you know. So look right here, right? And they're just pointing to some area so your eye has some place to look. And you're looking at the tennis ball because that's where, um, you know, that's where the Hulk is or that's where, you know, whatever thing, your monster, your, your thing. But if there's an actor on the set, it's a lot uh, easier for the other actors to act, not just little kids, but for the other actors. In 2004, Polar Express came out from Robert Zemeckis. He uh, is the guy that did um, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and he was a big user of uh, special effects. This one did 3D and IMAX and mocap, all three, and it really broke a lot of ground. It really broke a lot of ground. It's Tom Hanks there. It broke a lot of ground uh, by not just doing motion capture, but by making it 3D and releasing it in IMAX theater. So it's a it's a more important film than uh, a lot of people uh, give it credit for. And it made pretty good money, too. It made a big profit uh, in IMAX theaters, especially. We start to have the virtual backlot or the digital backlot where the actors just go into a room and the walls are, are green, sometimes blue, and shoot the whole movie. Okay, so I have a nice link to uh, uh, Sin City. Uh, uh, Robert Rodriguez, 15-minute flick school. You don't have to watch the whole thing, but you'll see how he put that together. Sky Captain, The World of Tomorrow. 300 uh, was another uh, digital backlot movie. Um, uh, the uh, the um, Jungle Book was a digital backlot movie. Uh, so they're not The Lion King. The Lion King is 100% uh, uh, computer, but... Um, no, no humans were uh, on set for uh, The Lion King. But there are a number of movies, and there are a number of movies with a, a large amounts of them, uh, the Star Wars movies and even the Marvel movies would have large amounts of digital back lot, but not 100% the way Sin City and Sky Captain and The World of Tomorrow were. So we get the rise of 3D movies, um, and studios love 3D movies. And I hate to tell you this, you probably could figure it out on your own, but it's not really for the art. Okay, they get to charge higher ticket prices and they're harder to pirate. And there are a few artists out there, like James Cameron, that are going to really use 3D. Sadly, um, a lot of movies are going to be shot with regular cameras and they're going to be converted. And I don't think the conversion 3D movie is nearly as good as a real 3D movie. We have two eyes uh, a few inches apart on our heads. That's how we see in 3D. We are predator animals, the way the way uh, tigers and wolves are. We are not prey animals, the way rabbits and squirrels are, with eyes on the sides of our heads so we can run away. And converting, to me, it just doesn't... It looks like a pop-up card. It looks like a bunch of flat figures that are in front of each other. They don't look like spheres and things. They're getting better. Um, when I see uh, a, an all-animated uh, film like um, Despicable Me, they look fine. They look fine. That, that, those movies are fine in 3D for me. I'm editorializing here. But um, uh, I've seen a lot. I've seen a number of uh, Avengers movies, and they look like a big old jumble, and I don't think the directors are directing for 3D. So a while ago, we talked about how it took 30 plus years for color to become uh, really, really 100% in American movies, where sound only took about three years. And um, 3D, I mean, maybe in 30 or 40 years, everybody's going to say, how could you see all those flat movies? How could you see all those flat movies? I mean, 3D movies start coming out seriously with Avatar 10 years ago. And they're still around, but... When I ask my students in the classroom, only a few hands go up that have seen a 3D movie in the last two or three months. Well, it would be longer ago than that for, for now, but 
You know what I'm saying, right? Most people don't choose to go see 3D movies. They just aren't wowing people. And I guess that's kind of the way color was back in the 1940s. People were saying, eh, it's okay, no big deal. So Avatar, motion capture, and I've linked to a nice video showing how they do that with uh, the actors um, wearing these suits, and the suits have markers on it, and the cameras capture the movement, and basically they are uh, sort of getting like a spine, really, if you think about it. They're kind of doing the actor's spine, and then you can put any kind of a body over that spine, but basically all your movement, your running, your jumping, walking, sitting, all that stuff, which is kind of hard to animate, um, has been done. And now you put a body on there, and they have the bodies look sort of, you know, sort of like the actors. Um, but uh, but the, they're capturing, you know, the, the movement and the performance and all that, and the actors, of course, are saying their lines and, and so on. So instead of sitting in a makeup chair forever, which is what they would have done, right, they uh, have motion capture, I've linked to that. Also, uh, the Holy Grail would be photo real, and it's been around for a little while now. This is Benjamin Button from a number of years ago now. Um, now, he's an old man, okay, so, you know, wrinkled and spots and all that kind of stuff, but, uh, you know, getting pretty good. Now, today, there are lots and lots of movies with actors. Mostly, they're de-aged. We've seen practically everybody de-aged, from Robert De Niro uh, to um, Brad Pitt Robert Downey Jr., uh, Jeff Bridges, um, Johnny Depp. I mean, they've de-aged everybody. They've de-aged a lot of people. Um, what, for me, is going to be a step is just creating a, a person, creating something from scratch. Okay? Um, and they kind of did with Benjamin Button, but it's still based on Brad Pitt. But if you create something, not based on anybody, you create your own, then that's kind of, to me, that's kind of interesting. I would also think that they would maybe be thinking about doing famous people, maybe Marilyn Monroe, uh, maybe historical people like John Kennedy, uh, instead of finding actors that sort of look like Marilyn Monroe or John Kennedy or, or uh, somebody like that, Churchill or something, and making them sit in all that makeup, they might do a, they might do something like that. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, the de-aging has been very popular, right, because you can do a flashback scene, right? And flashbacks, it's always nice to be able to do a flashback. Um, and like I say, all those actors have had flashback scenes. De-aged. They're getting pretty good. Uh, the most recent is uh, Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci and some other people. Uh, and um, I would have to say, uh, there's some de-agers, Jeff Bridges, Kurt Russell, uh, De Niro and Pesci, right? There's a whole bunch of de-aged. Um, I would say the best is Sean Young, in Blade Runner 2049. That, to me, is the very best in de-aging. And, um, uh, you know, they're, sometimes you just kind of give them a digital facelift, right? They're sort of taking the, the saggy parts, right? There's the neck. They're sort of cleaning that up, a little bit of the wrinkles, a little bit of the wrinkles, softening that up. That wrinkle's still there, but it's not quite as prominent, okay? Right? So there's a little, there's a little thing right there. So, um, you don't want to go too far, making him uh, look, they, they had him a little younger, and I think the younger you try to make somebody, the, the more of a reach it is. Uh, I'm not sure how well that works. You can be the judge. Uh, a lot of these people, like Kurt Russell um, and Jeff Bridges, we've seen, they've been acting since they were teens. Both of those guys have been acting since they were teens, so when we see them as young people, we know what they're supposed to look like. And Johnny Depp, right? We know what these guys mostly are supposed to look like. Robert De Niro has been acting since he was in his 20s. Uh, and so I have linked to Crossing the Uncanny Valley and the very last topic, which we kind of talked about in uh, journalism, I think, is deep fake. And uh, so, you know, what can be trusted? And for some reason, people on the Internet, they love putting Nicolas Cage in every movie known to man. Uh, he's in Lord of the Rings, he's in, I don't know, Avengers, he's in every movie, and there he is as Amy Adams in, I think she's Lois Lane in Superman, I'm not sure, but uh, anyway, um, you know, putting people's faces, and they also have some technology to take voices, if they, if you have hours and hours and hours of somebody talking, like politicians and people like that, they can even 
do voices, uh, and you don't need somebody that that uh, uh, can do somebody else's voice. Um, you just have you have that person's voice because there's enough of a bank of uh, of them talking. So that's kind of scary, and that leads us into that odd situation. We don't want to believe everything because stuff can be faked, but we don't want to not believe anything. Say, oh, that can't happen. Everything can be faked, right? We, there's, there's, there's a middle point. We don't believe everything, but we don't believe nothing, right? We've got to have a middle point where we can trust some stuff, but maybe not everything. Right? We, we're going to have to learn to, to uh, figure it out, hopefully be able to trust the source. If it's a good source, if it's a national broadcast or, or a newspaper, something like that, New York Times or CBS or something, um, but yeah, you could put you. Who knows what they could have, Putin or uh, tr Trump or anybody say, right? You could put somebody's face and have the words come out and all that. It gets kind of scary. Anyway, that's CGI computer generated imagery getting kind of scary. But that is it for us and and uh, our three part uh, unit on history of motion pictures business, kind of centering in on the business and the technology and some of the art, and I believe you are now ready to take test number one, double check your syllabus, and then after that, uh, join me again for class six. Thank you so much. See you next time.